Hi everyone, Sean Paul Ellis here from the Saturday Morning Cartoons Podcast. Remember, that's morning with you. Some very quick pre-show announcements. I know I say they're quick and then I ramble on for a while. Promise I will keep them short today. So what are we talking about? We got a couple quick shout outs, quick request, and then what is actually happening on today's episode. So let's start with some shout outs on episode 246, our Steven Universe, the movie review. We have Flowey178 replies with a with a kind of a like an offset smile face. I don't know what the heck that's called. <sighs> Flowey, I don't I don't know what's up. What's going on with you? Uh smiley face emoji back, friend. Just trying to review this cartoon that we like. So hope you enjoyed it as well. On Twitter, we want to recognize user for the gonzo. You are always asking us amazing questions and reminding us of weird cartoons. We love it and thank you so much for the gonzo. You are the best. A very quick ask. We have a Patreon. You can support this show and our original content. It's the cost of a cup of coffee, and we're not asking for Starbucks coffee. We know it's pumpkin spice latte season. We're not asking for that. We're asking for diner greasy spoon coffee. Real cheap, but still pretty good coffee. It all goes into keeping this show ad-free so that we don't have to try to sell you a mattress or ED pills or stamps. (laughs) Get the crap out of here. Oh, If you want to support, you can go to our social media, and you can click on our Patreon link. Thank you, and thank you for listening to our request. We really appreciate it from the bottom of our cartoon hearts. So what is actually on today's episode? We've got another Netflix original, and it's a movie, and it's based off of a book, so rule of three. We are talking about The Last Kids on Earth. We also have an interview with star Nick Wolfhard. This show is asking the questions, what would you do after the apocalypse? How would you treat your friends? And how would you treat the people that you care about? All of this and more. So now, on with the show. Hello and welcome to Saturday Morning Cartoons, the Collider.com weekly podcast for all things including animation, news, reviews, and interviews coming to you all the way from inside of a zombie ball inhabiting your middle school hallways. I'll be your co-host Sean Paul Ellis and joining me playing video games and eating snacks in a decked out treehouse is my co-host Dave Trumbor. Welcome Dave. How's it going? But what are you stuck in that school in a zombie ball for? I got got Cheetos, I got... Hot wings. I got what are the what are the spicy ones the kids like these days? Takis. Uh, takis. Are takis yeah. hot by default? Yeah, takis are hot. Sure, wrap, I got those. Got wrap I, snacks. Everything. Like everything you want. I got a little yeah. Debbie. She's chilling up here. <laughs> We're just waiting for you. She's got a lot of stuff. No, got no, Oscar I'll be, Mayer. I'll be honest. It's just very warm and very comfortable in the middle of the zombie ball. I've always wondered what it would be like to be in the middle of like a zombie ball where you're like you're safe because they can't quite get to you, but right. it's also terrifying and probably smells really bad. Just imagine like a bunch of love sack, uh, you know, uh, seating cushions yeah. just kind of all enveloping and surrounding you. And you're just like, this is pleasant. But they're also alive and trying to eat your flesh. Well, I mean, I'm, I'm pretty much already a zombie. So, I mean, to be in the ball, I have to. It's not like a zorb where the zombies are outside of the zorb and they're like trying to get in. And I'm like, nope, got to keep moving. You know, no, I'm 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 dead. Well, it was nice <laughs> to know you and your yeah. your zorb. <laughs> After after two hundred and what forty eight episodes, I'm I'm just dead. He's we've just all dead. So we've all figured that out. I'll be looking for a new co host if you want to join me up in the treehouse and eat all our <laughs> kinds of snacks. So feel free to call into that that cartoon hotline. Yeah, there it. wasn't there wasn't even a moment of silence for nah. my passing. You're just like you know what uh, applications are open. They've I'm doing been, interviews next week. They've been just open. start this up. <laughs> they've been open. They've been open. <laughs> <laughs> Ouch. Sorry, dude. Oh, right in my zombie heart. Right in that your hurts. zorb. Your Zorbital. <laughs> oh, man. If you are not familiar with any of this banter and what it means for today's episode, we are talking about the Netflix series, The Last Kids on Earth. We are obviously talking to you now three days before this comes out yep. and spoilers. before the actual release of it. So there are going to be some spoilers. So just be on the lookout for that. We're going to be talking about this. But at the same time, This is all based on a book that's been out for about five years anyway, so I don't know what to tell you other than maybe go read the book. Yeah, definitely. You still have time to go check the books out, uh, he says, even though we haven't. Um, (laughs) But there there are five of them out. Actually, I believe it's the fifth one that's going to be coming out on the day that this new series actually arrives. So when The Last Kids on Earth shows up on Netflix on Tuesday, September 17th, 2019, unless you're listening to us from the future somehow, 
The Last Kids on Earth, and The Midnight Blade will be out in bookstores everywhere and probably uh, on digital websites too where they also sell the books. So you can check yeah. that out. So you can read a new book and check out the series and listen to our podcast all at the same time. Exactly, exactly. Well, I want to say I don't know a ton about The Last Kids on Earth. Nope. So let's get into a little bit of a plot synopsis. So to help us out with our actual plot synopsis, we're going to turn this over to longtime listener in front of the show, Bobby Anthem, to give us a little bit more of what actually The Last Kids on Earth entails. So Bobby, take it away. The Last Kids on Earth follows 13-year-old Jack Sullivan and his band of middle schoolers who live in a decked-out treehouse, play video games, and battle zombies in the aftermath of the monster apocalypse. It's a hilarious adventure filled with crazy gadgets and a lifetime supply of action. Awesome, Bobby. That's actually the voice that I want to hear during the entire apocalypse as it would be happening anyway. How do you want to like... hear this? Do you want do you want him to be on like the loudspeaker announcing like where you, where to go for like shelter or you know, or do you want him to be like I don't know, a character that shows up at the end of your first adventure and has like a threatening menacing voice that you're not sure if he's a uh, an ally or an enemy yet Which see one? all the above all the above <laughs> yeah i and and just an extra d where i want him to kind of then narrate how bad of a job i'm doing in a post-apocalyptic world where he's sort of my internal monologue where the entire time he says like i don't think you should do that sean and i'm like i think i can and then i fall flat on my face and then i just hear like and i told you so in the back of my head that's just my conscience i just want bobby Hantham to be my conscience so like the new jiminy cricket he can just be the voice of jiminy cricket that'll be a real <laughs> twist That'd be a real. I would twist. love that. I'm into it, <laughs> Bobby. Anytime Down. you wanna you wanna narrate our consciences, uh, feel free to do so. You're you're saying it like it's all combined, like it's human instrumentality project. The funny thing is, I tried to like spell it in my head as I was saying it, and still got it completely wrong. I think it's fine. Thank you so much. Fine. I appreciate <laughs> you. Don't don't ever change out of your zorb. <laughs> out of my zorb. I'm staying in this for the yeah. entire episode. We'll work this out. <laughs> So as we mentioned, this is based on an actual yeah. uh, novel. I believe the subsection of literature is middle school literature yeah. that they have for and, this. And they have this tagged as kind of like a, a quote-unquote children's illustrated novel, which doesn't you don't hear that too often uh, these days. Maybe we did in the past. I don't know. But it's not really a comic book. It's not really just a straight you know uh, children's novel. It's kind of – it's closer to a graphic novel, I would say. Right. Because it's a, lot, it's a decent amount of text. And then there's a, quite a, a, a decent like smattering of um, illustrations and stuff throughout. And the illustrations are cool because some of them are kind of action-packed and focused on the characters and whatever's going on in that particular scene. But other ones are kind of like, you know, blown up blueprints of like a treehouse or a vehicle that you would take through uh, on your adventures or things like that. So kind of like a mishmash of, uh, of different things to kind of complement the storytelling. And we can talk about in a minute whether that the animated adaptation kind of worked to those strengths or not. And we should also mention that in addition to our review that we have for this episode too, we also have a very special interview, Dave, that you had an opportunity to also get a chance to talk with one of the voice actors, correct? Yeah, absolutely. So I got a chance to talk with Nick Wolfhard, who voices the lead character of Jack uh, in this entirety of this series. So he's, you know, he's the main guy. Sometimes he's kind of on his own and he's got nobody else to talk to but himself and his vlog recorder. And other times he gets to interact with some other characters as well. But yeah, we have an interview with uh, Mr. Wolfhard coming up in a little bit. And if that name sounds familiar, it might be because his brother, Finn Wolfhard, is not only on Stranger Things, but he was also in uh, Carmen Sandiego. So I got a chance to talk to him for the Carmen Sandiego series, also on Netflix. So the Wolfhards and Netflix together again. Something that nobody ever thought would be possible. Nobody and here thought. we are. Here we are in 2019 making that happen. It's beautiful. <laughs> I have to say, too, and I, speaking of interviews, this is just like a random plug from myself, but I just uh, realized that there is an audiobook version of these comics as well, um, but they're also uh, narrated by Robbie Damon. Robbie Damon, oh. voice of the newer Spider-Man. Great. And I got to talk to him like when they were launching Spider-Man, too, so that was pretty cool. Um, I'm glad things have gone well for him. Uh, he's super excited to, you know, to be voicing that character, and fans out there have really responded well to him, too, so I'd love to see his name pop up and to see, you know, more opportunities for decent people doing some pretty cool work. It's good stuff. Very cool. Yeah. Very cool. Well, we are going to get into our review of this cartoon before we turn this over to one of the brothers, Wolfhard, 
to talk a little bit more about his experience with the show. I want to know um, if they're like the Hemsworths too. I didn't look this up. I don't know if there's like eight of them hanging around all doing different stuff. If they just start pulling them like out of out of the woodwork, I mean, then they're, then they're, yeah, they might be. You think they would go by like the wolf pack or something though, if there were more than oh, like two of them. God, what a missed opportunity if they're they not. They might be that doing is, it. I don't know. Wolfheart fans is out there, let branding. us know. Or the Wolfheart yeah. fans can be the wolf pack. If you guys want to be the wolf pack, he says as like a 40 year old out of touch <laughs> blogger that doesn't know what he's talking about. Sure. You could be the wolf pack. Go crazy. And if you want to, and if you want to be a fan of Dave Trumbor, we mm. call them the troubles. So troubles if you guys want to be in the, in the trouble. Just uh, just let us know. Uh, somebody I follow on Twitter said, anytime they see my name, they complete it in their head as Trumbledore. So if you want to go with that, too, I'm more than happy. <laughs> that is so good. That's very cute. I like the Trumbledores. They sound so it. much more fun than I actually am in real life, too. So <laughs> I appreciate it. Can I, can I make a quick mention for the other cast members that pop up here as well? So I did mention, you know, it's not just Jack kind of on his own. There are some other characters that will pop up. And if you've read the books or seen them at all, you, you probably know who they are. So we've got Dirk. Uh, Dirk Savage, who's voiced by Charles, uh, I want to say Demers, Charles mm-hmm. Demers, apologies if any of these pronunciations are wrong, Quint Baker, uh, Gar- by, voiced by Garland Witt, uh, June, it was June Del Toro, is that correct? Correct, June Del, Do- June voiced, Del Toro. June Del Toro, voiced by uh, Monse Hernandez, and then a couple of the creatures in this series, voiced by Brian Drummond, a fantastic creature effects work. And then there's a special one, which we're going to save till the end, because it is pretty spoilery, it's kind of like an end credit stinger. So we're going to leave right. that one till the end of our discussion. If you guys are still around, you can find out then, or you can turn it off and jump to the interview if you want to avoid that one altogether. Great. Well, one of the things that we've been doing on this show is that we have been talking about the good, the bad, and the ugly. No, we're not talking about the Sergio Leone uh, wonderful spaghetti western from 1966 starring Clint Eastwood. We're talking about how we're going to approach taking a look at The Last Kids on Earth. So we're going to start with talking about what we liked about it, what was good about this. Then we're going to talk about what was bad, what maybe didn't resonate, what didn't hit for us in terms of this show. And then instead of ugly, because we're not going to get ugly with this, uh, we're going to turn to the LOL. So the good, the bad, and the LOL kind of round this out with everything that made us laugh, knowing and understanding and appreciating that a lot of people and a lot of time and energy went into creating this. And so we kind of want to compliment sandwich this as much as possible. So for tonight... Dave, where was where did this land for you in terms of what was good about the show? What did you it, like about this? Yeah, I thought it was really strange that they opted to go for like an animated kids version of the Will Forte series, Last Man on Earth. It was really kind of <laughs> odd that they just straight, you know, they just went for it, which is kind of nice, but I didn't expect it. You didn't expect it? I didn't expect it, no. Hmm. Hmm. Uh, no, this has nothing to do with that. If you're like, that sounds familiar, I wonder if it now has nothing to do with that. I actually, I really liked... And this is going to be a point of contention, I feel. I really like the animation style. Okay. And I'll tell you why. It's not really traditional. It's, I, haven't, I haven't really seen much like it before. It's kind of a weird blend of like a traditionally animated show, a CG animated show, and a motion comic. It weirdly feels like uh, just like a blend of those three things. And sometimes, sometimes it's a little jank the way they kind of work together because it feels like they're layering like maybe three different you know, layers of animation styles on top of each other. And sometimes there's a little bit of a disconnect. But for the most part, because of where it came from as a, uh, you know, children's illustrated novel, there's got to be a better term for that, as a, essentially like a graphic novel. I kind of like that they kept that look similar to the source material. But what about you? I, I enjoyed the animation as well. Okay. I, I will say that there, there are some parts where looking at some of the pictures and some of the uh, graphics that they used for the book, it seemed like they were a little... Uh, they were a little darker in tone mm. or maybe just in like the, the color pattern that they had decided to use. I will say the animation for this is a lot brighter It is very bright. uh, in terms of a post apocalyptic world, which sometimes kind of goes back and forth. The monsters are very vibrant. There is a lot of color. They really kind of pop uh, over the, the landscape and everything that they created. Everything feels very lush. Like there's a lot of content to it to begin with, but there are moments where it can feel a little overly CGI and kind of stray a little bit away from sort of that traditional animation. There are some also moments where you kind of see arms move and it sort of feels like it's something that you would have seen on like a flash animation yeah. every once in a while, which is not terrible. I mean, that animation style has come a long way. And so just kind of noticing and pointing them out, I did enjoy the animation. There were some moments of jank for me, but honestly, I've gotten to the point now where I've watched so many cartoons that I 
can come to appreciate jank and not have that kind of impact or affect my opinion of this. I will say one of the things that I really loved, probably the the top thing that I loved about this cartoon uh, is just the lore. I, I wanted to cool. know I wanted to know so much about what was going on. I, I made mention about lush environments. There's lush content and things that are crawling out of every nook and cranny of this town, and they don't really get a chance to explore or talk right. about all of it. And for me, seeing a, a new weird creature or a new weird uh, monster that kind of pops out of nowhere, I want to know more about that. They created such a, a rich environment even with a hole in the sky that opens up at the moment when this apocalypse is beginning. How did that happen? I want to explore and understand and figure out all of that stuff. So that really kind of kept me engaged with seeing new creatures, new monsters, uh, new little things that kind of just pop up in this world that kind of really show that there is some threat to these kids. And that goes to kind of one of the other points that I had too was the pacing of this because it's a, it's essentially like an hour and five minute, hour and 10 minute special, but you can see where it was kind of stitched together from previously, you know, the, the previous plan was to adapt it as episodes, right? So maybe four, maybe five episodes, and then or maybe even only three, I don't know. But uh, then they kind of stitch it together into one movie and it works as a movie. Plot wise, it's fine. You have, you're introduced to Jack Sullivan, the main character who's kind of on his own trying to survive this apocalypse. He's looking for both his best friend and any other survivors, but he's also looking for one particular girl from his uh, middle school class. And then sort of the third act is the team, now that they're together, they have an obstacle to overcome, so they have to kind of like get together and work together in order to do that. So it would have worked episodically, but it also works as a movie, and that's fine. The issue is, like Sean was mentioning, you don't get to dive into the lore all that much. You get a little smattering here or there, you get just enough of an introduction to get you into the world. This is very much an introductory setup chapter, if you want to call that. This, uh, I believe this special takes care of the entire first book. So I think what they're trying to do is each season, or each special, depending on how they format it, will adapt one book in the series. So you should have a total of like one movie in four seasons, or if you want to look at it overall, five seasons. Which is good, because that means more of that stuff can be explored as they go. So yeah... You have multiple portals opening in the sky. You have all kinds of monsters that this kid is naming, but we don't know where they come from, what they're up to, why they're there. We've got zombies all over the place. You don't know how they turned into zombies (laughs) to begin with at all. Like, nobody else is around, too. There's, like, no adults, really, as far as we know. There are other sentient creatures out there, some friendly, some not, and they kind of keep you guessing. So there was a lot of really good stuff here. Just, like, a lot of these adaptations, we just want more. Right. Yeah. I will say another positive thing that I really did enjoy is that I thought the voice acting, I thought all the voice acting was great. Yeah. I thought they did a really good job. Wonderful job, Nick Wolfhard. Really enjoyed your performance. So I'll I'll make sure to let him know during the interview that I recorded previously. Oh, perfect. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, No, I thought, I thought uh, the entire cast of everybody that they had, which, you know, was very limited in scope. But I think everybody that was on there, I think probably the character or the, uh, Charles Demers. I really enjoyed Dirk's character. He's great. I was glad to see him have such a fun trajectory and arc in terms of his realization and kind of understanding of the the predicament and situation that he's in. So I was very excited to see that kind of turnaround uh, for that character. Well, let's talk about that a little bit because one of my other points here is how they they establish tropes that you're familiar with, especially if you're you know older like we are and have watched four decades of cartoons at this point. But then they flip them. So I don't know if it's necessarily like, I don't want to call it, like it's not a super clever way to do it, but they're, they're, a, they're very obvious and uh, upfront about establishing tropes and then flipping them by the time you get to the end of the special. So hmm. just for example, maybe you disagree, but no, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm curious to see where you go with this sure, because yeah. I, I, yeah, cause this, this kind of transitions into some of the stuff that I didn't love as much. Fair so enough. I'm, I'm curious to hear your, your point on this yeah so jack sullivan is our kind of traditional typical hero he's narrating his own story he's doing it for a vlog which i think is is kind of funny because it's like otherwise you're just a crazy person talking to yourself like will forte in the middle of nowhere um (laughs) so he's he's doing that he's got plans like he wants to be this legendary hero Uh, there's nobody else around at the moment so he's got to like find some other people so they can at least appreciate his story but his other main thing is that he wants to save the damsel in distress june del toro 
So he wants to be this classic hero and he wants to get his princess, essentially. Mm-hmm. They don't... He, he's stuck on that because of the comic books he's read and written with his friend, because of the TV shows and movies that he's watched, because of the stories that he's seen before that. But over the course of this special, he kind of gets shaken out of that a little bit as far as... <sighs> Just uh, just as far as all right, the, all the right. other characters don't fall in line with his expectations. He still at the end of it is just kind of like, I'm I'm the hero and I did it and we formed a great team. But the other characters don't they're not forced into his little boxes. You know, June Del Toro is not a damsel in distress. Dirk is not a mindless bully that just picks on them for no reason and doesn't have any depth to him. Quint is not, he's probably the weakest, I would think, as far as, like, uh, character progression goes and defying tropes. Quint is not just, like, this, the tech-savvy smart guy, even though he kind of is, uh, as far as, like, a sidekick. But okay. it's, it's Jack, I think Jack needs to be nudged a little bit further out of his traditional hero's journey kind of thing. Uh, well, let's yeah, dive okay. into the bad. So what's your take on it? All right. Now, I, I, had a, I had a difficult time with the juggling of tropes as well as also different storylines. You know, I felt that there was almost too much in certain instances that were going on here. As you mentioned, we're juggling a damsel in distress story, which I I I have a lot to say about this. We're we're looking at a survival tale. We're looking at uh, a documentarian trope, a post apocalyptic trope, lore for all of these monsters. Also, a buddy comedy at the same time. So there's a lot of things that they're trying to juggle within an hour and five minutes. And I, I felt that in certain cases, some of these things kind of didn't get a chance to, you know, really kind of resonate. And plus, the one that I'm missing the most is just sort of like the past that they have for Jack, like yeah. his upbringing and his story. It's heartbreaking. And the things that happen to him on day one are terrible. And that's awful. And that's bullshit to have to watch this and say, all right, I'm kind of pissed off about this. And he just kind of picks up and moves on. And I'm like, no, I, I would dwell. I'd be a little bit pissed off about this. He has very few moments where he kind of, he, where he does dwell. There are times where he's either talking to Quint, who he gets reunited with, uh, or there's times where he's talking to his, his drone video, and then he's like, well, I've got to edit this out later. He's avoiding a lot of that stuff. So it's like, coming, right. it's bubbling to the surface at times. Let, let's clarify this real quick. So sure. Jack was an uh, orphan. He's an orphan. He's an orphan. And he's grown up in a number of like foster families, but he's never Mm -hmm. really had his own quote unquote family that he really felt like he was a part of. And early in this story, when the apocalypse happens, the foster family that he's currently living with just abandons him. They're gone. It's crazy. They don't take him out. It's fucking crazy. Yeah. Yeah. It's, you see this moment where he gets back from school and he is jumping over a fence and he has a line of sight to the driveway of his foster family. Yeah. And they are ripping out of the driveway and immediately taken off. And yeah. that's that to me. I was like, let's let's sit and talk about that for a little while. But that's now the most. Yeah. That, but at the same time, that became like the most interesting thing that had happened at that point. You know, in addition to this post apocalyptic, you know, tale that was unfolding. And so if you're not going to unpack anything, you know, that that's kind of where I entered into this with thinking, like, just unpack something. Like, unpack something, not even fully, but just begin to unzip the suitcase a little bit. And I'll say for the one thing that I felt that they began to unpack, which was the one that I kind of took the most uh, grievances with, was the damsel in distress Mm. narrative and trope that they used with the rescuing of June Del Toro. And they spent, and, and Dave, you mentioned this perfectly, this is an hour and five minute. They spent 44 minutes getting to that point. And I, I really thought to myself, if they could have gotten to it sooner, they could have had more fun in this world that they're playing in. And at this moment, you realize that, you know, the, our main character, we have Jack putting all of his friends in mortal danger for a girl that he thinks is in this location. Obviously, because this is a cartoon and because we're suspending disbelief, of course she's there. Like, she has to be there in order for this story to be able to progress. But at this moment, then, he meets her, he finds her, and then he kind of, like, pressures and guilt trips her into coming back to this treehouse. In fact, he's even given a moment. He's given one moment up on top of the rooftop of the school where he could have had an unbelievably empathetic, sympathetic moment where he said to her, like, I completely understand where you're going. Like, I'm a foster kid and my family took off. They got out of here and you saw your family go off as well. 
and this is a lonely place and this is hard. And look, we're the only four people that we know about that exist in this town. I, I like, I don't want to be alone. I don't want to be alone and I'm scared and I'd feel better if I was around other people and I'd feel better knowing the people that I care about are protected and taken care of. Uh, and if we can do that together, great. If not, I completely respect your boundaries. But then he's just like, but like, what if you came back? Like, what if you came back to the treehouse? And then he's rewarded for that behavior where she finally just throws her arms up and is like, yeah, I guess I'll go back to the treehouse with you. Well, I think part of it is it's, and that's worked out in the plot too, because they essentially bring like the big bad of the story to her um, defensible position. And they're like, well, this place is screwed and it's kind of overrun by zombie balls and all kinds of stuff. Like, I'm, I'm <laughs> curious to see where this goes because. I don't think Jack thinks he's the hero of his own story. And he's I not. think that this series may be now it is still for kids. So I don't know how you know deep they get with it, but I think that it may be the, the his journey may be discovering that he is not necessarily the traditional hero that he thinks he is, that he kind of gets in his own way a lot of the times and that his own kind of like hubris and um, whatever is causing more problems than necessary. Cause he is kind of frustrating at times. He's very frustrating with with most of the things that he does. He's fun, but he's also very frustrating. Dave, there's a moment where he insults June Del Toro, his crush, and says, yeah, it's dumb and easy, just like field hockey, the thing that she loves to play. Now, he's negging her he in is, these moments. But it's to get a rise out of her, too, because then after that, she kind of like does the thing, and then they, they end up kind of bonding together. I don't mind that as much, because that's kind of like them with weird, weird like middle school psychology of trying to figure each other out and things like that. I don't know. I thought about it this way, Dave. You know, a lot of times when we watch some of these cartoons and there's misogynistic behavior that we have and it happened in the 70s, the 80s, or the 90s and you and I are just like, this is a thing that's prevalent in this show that we are watching, this weird cartoon, and we have to acknowledge it and at the time that this was written, this is not great. And it, we're not excusing it, we're just we're pointing out and we're stating the fact of where we are right now. This is a show that has some of that misogyny and it came out in 2019. That's frustrating. That's well, frustrating and it feels like nobody learned a lesson. Well, now here's the question though. So how do you teach a lesson like that if you if you have a character who's going to kind of act that way? The way I would say to do it is to have characters around him that are kind of going to reflect on him being like, this isn't cool. And maybe they just haven't got there yet in this series. I don't know. But and I, I I'm agree hoping with that his journey is going to be kind of like learning that like what he has done as a loner, what he has taken from movies and comics and TV shows as like the the prototypical kind of like alpha or male role or whatever it is, not necessarily how it works in reality, whether it's post-apocalypse or not. Because everybody else in this show has like been flipped. June Del Toro is very far from a damsel in distress. She's very capable of not only defending herself, she's fine on her own. She would have been fine without <laughs> <laughs> she is maybe the most capable between her other and than Dirk. Dirk. Yeah. Yeah. But her, and that between was her and Dirk. Thing. So Dirk wasn't, you know, he was a bully. He picked on these kids in school. But then when they teamed up with him, they kind of found some common ground and they just talked to each other. And then they ended up kind of uh, each covering for the other's weaknesses. Right. Right. Dirk, Dirk, to be honest, doesn't really need them, but he gets to hang out with them and be friends and like have snacks and get to ride around a big mama, which I loved. Yeah, And then Quint, too, is kind of like, yeah, he's their tech team. So they've kind of like, they've put the team together. It's just that, weirdly, Jack is kind of, he's kind of the weak link. Uh, and I'm yeah. hoping that the full story, once we get to see it, is his kind of arc over time. I would love I to. I just think it's a different, it's not, it's not traditional. That's all. Yeah, I would, I would love to have him be around people that would kind of reflect those things back to him and help him kind of understand. And it seems like there's a lot more stuff there for him to kind of unpackage and and address and deal with as a main character in this show to make this something that's rich and rewarding. We'll see. I, I don't know how deep they're going to get with it. I don't know how deep the, the books really get to. And the crazy thing about the books, they didn't come out that long ago either. So I know. There's not really any excuse. 20, 2015 <laughs> is when this came out. So if this, and that's the thing that Dave and I don't have an assessment about. So if you're listening to us and you're like, that's not the way it is in the book, sure. the book is very different. Please tweeted us, message us, let us know. I'm legitimately interested in reading the book now as a result of watching this yeah. to see the differences that they have between them uh, and, and see if the, the book is a little bit darker, if it's a little bit grittier, you know, what the actual content is. So it's, I, I'm, I'm interested and I'm intrigued. I will, I will close the book on the things that I think that might be bad about this show for the time being. Anything else? Nah, I don't really have anything that didn't work for me. It's just a problematic Jack a little bit. 
But yeah. um, beyond that, I thought everybody else was great. Um, and, and most of them come from the LOLs. So anything that particularly stuck out as uh, making you laugh, for better or worse. There was something. The the ping pong table. You like the ping pong I, table? Okay. I laughed at the ping pong table just because I have so many fond memories of being a kid. Yeah. Going to sleepovers where friends are like, we're going to stay up all night and we're never going to sleep and it'll be cool. And then it's three o'clock in the morning and I remember being in a friend's basement playing ping pong with somebody else that I had never really talked to. Mm. And we played for like an hour and had a fun conversation. I was like, this is a great way to talk and meet people. I traveled when you and I were in school together yeah. over a summer uh, for three weeks to South America. And at one of the hostels, they had a ping pong table outside. And every night, we would just go out with the other people. And there was a huge language barrier. But we would just laugh because we were playing this game and we understood those rules. And right. so it was super fun to me, very relatable. That made me laugh out loud because I was like, of course, of course, middle schoolers, you would put a ping pong table. That's that's perfect. Even like college, like my uh, what was it, sophomore roommate and stuff. We didn't have a lot in common. We didn't really get along all that much, but we would just go down and play ping pong at like the local student center or whatever. Yeah, and he was great. He was awesome. But he like taught me more like how to play and just like took it easy on me most of the time. But that, that's like <laughs> the only time that we kind of like connected over stuff was playing ping pong, which was weird. But I love right. stuff like that in the show because it is it is in every way wish fulfillment for like a 12 or 13 year old kid especially right. boys probably um i don't know how much of it's wish fulfillment for a 12 or 13 year old girl or otherwise but for boys it's like zombie apocalypse you get to run around and fight monsters you get a big fuzzy monster dog to hang out with you you get to hang out with all your friends in a crazy fortified treehouse you get to dig a moat you get to play with fireworks and rockets you get to make weapons you get to you get to drive around in a jeep that's all like kitted out and stuff. Like I loved everything <laughs> about like all this little wish fulfillment stuff because pretty much every step that these kids took, I was like, I probably would have done the same thing. Or like if I was writing that story, I would have made that same decision or that choice. So I love that stuff. Um, what's something else that stuck out to you besides ping and ponging? I, I definitely liked some of the moments. I, I know that you mentioned sort of the, the problematic Jack uh, every <laughs> once in a while. I loved the moments when you would your Dirk, he would just go like he would just make comments that reflected exactly what I was thinking where he'd go like, knock it off, yeah. you know, or just or have like a comment where you hear Jack kind of running his mouth and you're like, just just please just five minutes, Jack, just shut up. Just just relax. <laughs> just give us silence for a few. Yeah. And I felt like Dirk did a good job of, of kind of uh, saying, yeah, of saying the things that I was thinking yeah. as the viewer watching the cartoon. Uh, that and I'll say I loved uh Quint Co inventions. He was Quint great. Co inventions. Those are super fun. They were very enjoyable to watch. Uh, sometimes they seem to be a little bit hit or miss. That's great. Yeah, I, I love of sort of the the unpredictability about some of the things that he was creating, especially the uh, what was it the the zombie like scream machine that they put, which is super smart. I mean, I don't know why they haven't done that more often on The Walking Dead, but maybe they ran out of yeah. zooms <laughs> at this point. I don't know. Um, what what did you think about the achievement badges? I could see how that people could like it or it could rub you the wrong way. Uh, there was some of it that felt a little bit too Fortnite-y for me. Sure. Uh, like they were trying to capitalize off something that's cool and popular in pop culture at the moment. Uh, I, I, I love the idea of kind of zooming in and examining a lot of the, the creatures and monsters to sort of show some of the stats yeah. and the details. I thought that was really fun. The achievement aspect of it was kind of missed for me. I, I like gamification of something. Right. It's just, there was a moment where I kind of felt like, was there an actual threat to these kids? Because, or especially to Jack, because nothing seems to phase him. He seems to have no scratches. Yeah. Even when he gets in like peril and he's like, this is my, I'm going to die face. It's just kind yeah. of like, it's all kind of like jokey and, and kind of, it's all played for gags. And I get it because you're not trying to like scare kids. It's not, you know, it's not even like troll hunters level of like peril or world ending or whatever. Everything's right. Everything's done for fun. Like everything is essentially a comic book at this point right. for better or worse. So I kind of like the achievement badges because yeah, it did make it seem like he was gamifying his experience and you just get to make stuff up wherever you go. Like if you if you dig a moat, you're like, oh, I just got an achievement badge. Like you can just make it up as you go. I wish real life was like that. But I was yeah. I was okay with that. I like when they would pop up and they'd be kind of cutesy. There were a couple that like were particularly funny. But um, I think the only other thing that really stuck out to me was the like the number of pop culture references that made it a little more enjoyable as a as an older viewer to be able to watch it. So there's stuff like from Shaun of the Dead. There's nods to that. They're not necessarily overt, but they're pretty dang close. So right. you can watch stuff like that and get a little chuckle out of it. There's a, a classic, uh, when they're up on the, the 
rooftop of the school shooting the tennis balls out and trying to like pick teachers or whatever <laughs> yeah. straight from like Dawn of the Dead. So I mean yeah. all kinds of stuff like that. Uh, a ton of like zombie and monster movie references and um, you know even like Terminator. There's just there's some shots mm. of the characters that are staged and lit and positioned in such a way that they're just pulled directly from the movies. And I thought that was an absolute blast. You could tell that the animators really had a good time with it and the creators also like looked for specific times to, to frame those things up. And for kids out there Probably gonna miss it, so it's it's fun to <laughs> to be able to watch it as an older person and be like, oh, that was a cool little reference there, because yeah. everything in Jack's life is steeped in nostalgia, and whether he kind of grows out of that and matures beyond it, we'll have to wait and see. If I was watching this cartoon with my children, I would have to stop at the end of it and say, why was Jack problematic in this show? Problematic Jack. Like, why was problematic Jack? Why were we seeing him as an early stages of an incel? Like I would how? I would say, yeah. I would say, like, yeah. you know, what did you think of Jack? What right. did you like about Jack? What didn't you like about what he did? Or right. things like that. But I don't know. It's just it's just me and my cat watching it. My cat has yet to talk back. <laughs> well, you know, there was very Zach Morris moments. Oh, sure. Where if you watch, there's a great series on Amazon Prime called Zach Morris's Trash, mm. where it talks about the fact that Zach Morris doesn't seem to listen to or respect his friends. He puts them in danger constantly without paying attention or really caring about their well-being. And then everything works out in the ends and he learns no lessons. And he's also like impervious. He's like, he's like dent proof. Nothing hurts him. Uh, we're sitting here recording this and I'm wearing like an ace ankle brace sock right now because I like twisted my ankle there are moments in this where he falls on his face and I'm like, that's a concussion. You fell out of a bus in front of your middle school. You're concussed. Don't get up. You're like, monster just, food now. Yeah, yeah. It's basically like, yeah. But it, I mean, I, again, I give it a lot of slack and a lot of leeway because it is for kind of younger viewers other than problematic Jack um, issues. But for the right. most part, like cartoon physics and, uh, you know, running for monsters and things like that. If this whole thing ended up being just like not a dream or whatever, tropey kind of like, Oh, it was all a dream the whole time or all imagination. Like I would it would make sense. Forget that. Forget like that I would be forget that. I would be so aggravated oh, if they did mad. a Dallas ending for this. I'd be mad, but it would also like I'm just saying that it would go towards explaining that if they wanted to ground it in reality. But I'm totally fine with the way that it is as like a cartoon post apocalyptic world. Just Jack just gotta straighten his act out. That's all. He's just yeah. gotta get it together and people gotta help him out along the way. I'm hoping. Yeah. Now, we did get an interesting tease at the end of this. So what do you make of our little special guest star who shows up at the end? I Well, I'm curious to see kind of where this goes, especially with this, this guest star, because we had a the stinger that we have is, in fact, the voice of Keith David. Who's the best. And who's the best. And he uh, has a line where he just goes, humans. And you see a picture of, I believe June. It was June Del Toro, a, yeah, with like a yeah. map. Yeah, in like a like almost in like a dossier. Yeah, it was <laughs> like kind of weird. Like a, it was like, like a, a Manila file folder. Or something, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, like he wandered over from the set of Jack Ryan. And yeah, was like, he had declassified humans. intel. Yeah. Humans. I don't so know where he found to... like a functioning printer. I guess there's still a FedEx operating oh, at that point. I don't, there's not even a functioning printer in the entire world the as far house. as I'm concerned right <laughs> now. And so the fact that they have one in a post-apocalyptic world, that's insane. That's that's where I draw the line in being able to suspend disbelief. Maybe the trolls or orcs or whatever the thrall is. And it, it's important to point out that there are notable actors coming to this series. Well, like Mark Hamill. Uh, yeah. What were some of the others? Was it Sigourney Weaver? Was that one of them? Or am I making that up uh, from Dark Crystal? You were making that up. Yeah, I'm um, making that up. She's in Dark Crystal, which you should also go watch. Yeah, you've got a you've got a lot of notable voice casts that are coming to this show. So yeah, we haven't they heard haven't, them yet. Yeah, they haven't arrived yet. Stick around and, and fingers crossed for problematic Jack. Well, you've heard our feelings about this, and before we have a chance to actually give you our final say of whether or not we recommend this or not, we're actually going to go and talk to Jack. We're going to talk to Nick Wolfhard. Problematic Jack. Now we're going to turn this over to Dave, who had an opportunity to interview. Jack, played by Nick Wolfhard. So please, Dave, take it away. So first of all, thank you for taking time out of your schedule to talk with me today about The Last Kids on Earth. Um, how did you get involved with the show? So the audition process was actually the longest I've ever had <laughs> for a part. Um, I want to say it started around February, and then I got the part around May. And this was this was like last year, too. And in, but it's funny because I was in Ireland for two weeks and I would have to do uh, callbacks 
while I was in Ireland over MP3, I believe. And then I remember uh, I originally auditioned for Jack as well as Dirk. And I think I believe I got two separate callbacks for both characters. Maybe I just got the one for Jack, but I definitely got an audition for Dirk. And then I remember in May, I was like half asleep in my bed and I got the email and I was like, yes. I like put my fist in the air, like out of sheer victory because of how long the process was and how much effort I put into it. And I was so happy I got it. Nice. So this is something that you were chasing kind of when you first heard about it? Yeah, that that's... Uh, that's right. My agent had basically sent me the main premise and everything, and I would go back and forth between doing MP3 auditions and actually going into the studio, and then I'd do maybe like an MP3 callback like I did in, in Ireland, and then, yeah, that, that's basically how it worked. Gotcha. Were you familiar with the books uh, before joining the cast, before even auditioning? Were you aware of them uh, beforehand? Weirdly, no, but I think that might have to do kind of with the fact that um, well, as a kid, for example, like I, I would read like Captain Underpants and Diary of a Wimpy Kid and stuff like that. And it seems like this is kind of that new generation version of those books. And the fact that it's so popular and the fact that so many kids like love it and read this like in school is awesome because I that was literally me and a lot of people I knew. So I'm I'm excited that I get to be part of that kind of like new generation adaptation of it. I'm really excited about that. Definitely. And you don't get to just be a part of it. You get to be the lead. You get to be the main kind of like solo <laughs> hero out there on his own before he forms up with his, his group <laughs> of friends. So what can you tease about the character of Jack? And what were your impressions of him as you got to learn about the character? Well, he's kind of a lonely guy to, <laughs> to, be, to begin with. He doesn't like to show it, though. His exterior is basically this, like, he thinks he's this big, tough action hero, when in reality, he's actually kind of a dork. He's actually kind of like me. <laughs> <laughs> I like to act cool, but, in, but, but I just come off like, like a total dummy. Um, but yeah, he, uh, he's, you know, he really wants to get all his friends together because, you know, as the title says, you know, Last Kids on Earth, they're the only people they've got, and he's kind of, I mean, who wouldn't be lonely in, like, the, the zombie apocalypse if it's just you after such a long period of time? Um, I'm living on my own right now. My parents and family are away, and they're away for about a month. So I definitely sympathize with the Jack <laughs> in terms of, you know, family and stuff. What can you say about his kind of approach to, because uh, he's used to kind of being alone. We learn that he's, you know, hasn't really had a family that he could call his own. But he's also willing to go out there and, and literally face monsters and do what needs to be done. So what can you say about maybe his like kind of courageous aspect? Well, it's, in my opinion, I think his courageous aspect is based off of just so many... My take on it is basically... He, it's based off of like just so many so much media he's consumed. And right. like he obviously he has, his own, he has his own comic as well that he writes with Quint. Um, but on top of that, I think he just really wants to prove himself. And he wants to make the best out of like a, a really bad situation, which I think I think Jack is probably an optimist like me, which I, I actually I really sympathize with. And I actually think that's probably it's kind of another reason why I kind of relate to the guy. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean that's that's basically kind of the kind of the gist of it. He's an optimist and he wants to really make the best out of a bad situation. Gotcha. And you recently had a chance to check out the show, the finished version of the show. Is that right? Yes, I did recently. Cool. It was it was really good. I really liked it. Yeah. So, awesome. what were your impressions of kind of like uh, the art style, how the characters kind of worked, how the story all kind kind of came together? Well, it's funny when we were first recording the special, we didn't know if it was going to be a special. We didn't know if it was going to be episodes. But I think that Netflix made uh, really like the right decision to make it a special because it all flows together so well in terms of just like adapting kind of the first book. First of all, the, the shading and the lighting is like it's absolutely gorgeous. There's some great 3D camera work as well that just, that just looks unbelievable. This is one of the best looking kid shows I think I've seen in a very long time. It really is. And the art style is, is very different for kind of like, for like a mainstream cartoon. It looks very unique compared to a lot of uh, mainstream stuff out there at the moment. Um, not to knock any of the other mainstream stuff, I'm just saying that like, I think 
uh, Last Kids on Earth because it's based off of kind of like a, a comic book graphic novel that art style that really helps it translate to animation in a really unique way in terms of this style. And I really appreciate that. Yeah, it really does look original. And like you said, that's not a bad thing or that's not knocking any other shows out there, but it does have its own unique kind of look to it, which helps to set it apart. It looked to me kind of like a, an old school cartoon, but also kind of like a motion comic meets a video game almost. It had a bunch of different kind of inspirations uh, and influences on it that really made yeah. it stand out. That was really cool. Yeah, there's some there's some great there's some great pixel art in there. There's yeah. some uh, the, the, some of the transitions are great. You got some Edgar Wright s uh, editing, which is really good. I actually I actually didn't know I didn't know until I saw the special that they were gonna go like that they were gonna do some Edgar Wright s editing. Right. There was one scene I remember doing where I remember saying the line that uh, kind of like what Simon Pegg said in, in Shaun of the Dead was like, okay, we'll go here, we'll do that, we'll do that. And we'll go over here, waiting until that's over. But I didn't say, but it's awesome that the, they really went full on on it. it, it it's great. Yeah, they really did, and there's a lot of, like, nods to, uh, and I guess the stories are like this, too. The There's nods to, like, pop culture references and, and things like that. Those are fun to, like, to kind of pick out. Did you have any suggestions or anything yeah. like that, or was it pretty much just what was on the script was, was, what, you, uh, was what you got to record? Oh, uh... Man, well, the problem, the thing is, is that at that point in time, recording the show, we were all so new to the project, so I didn't really feel comfortable, like, adding any suggestions or anything. Sure. I hope that, um, I hope that if we get to, you know, continue, uh, I I would love to share some, like, references and movie ideas, um, and, uh, yeah, that's what's great about it, because, obviously, this is a kid's show, but... There's some great stuff in there for like all ages, in my opinion. Like you can, all ages can kind of like appreciate the animation, the art style. Obviously, the references. Um, uh, there's a like I said, there's like a great Shaun of the Dead reference. There's um, there's some other stuff too. Uh, I think there's a Terminator one in there. Uh, so there's that. And, uh, yeah, no, I, in general, I just think a lot of people are really going to like this one. Yeah, definitely. And I'm kind of of the age of, you know, Max and I are, I don't know, like a week apart in our birthdays. So <laughs> we pretty much have the same, like, uh, like pop culture well to draw from. But then you guys are obviously playing younger characters than, than you actually are in real life. But you have, you know, more contemporary anime, animation, video games, all kind of stuff you can bring to it, too. So that could be fun, too. You mentioned something before. Yeah, exactly. I'm I'm definitely I'm definitely closer to the age of the audience who reads this book <laughs> than I am to to math. So what's great about that is if I do make suggestions in the future, um, maybe I can make some suggestions towards stuff that like you know other people have seen and stuff like that. You know what I would love to do? Yeah, I would love to a Scott Pilgrim. I would love to do a Scott Pilgrim reference. That'd be, that'd be a good one. That's a good I love Scott in. Pilgrim. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. That's another graphic novel. And I'm sure Max has read it. My brother Finn has like read every single book. I haven't, but we both love the movie. So there you go. Maybe you two can work together on an adaptation of that in the future. If they, if they bring it to uh, the small <laughs> screen. Oh man. The Scott Pilgrim cartoon. Is fantastic. That would be fun. We'll pin that one for later. Um, you mentioned earlier that, uh, you weren't sure if this was going to be, you know, episodic, like 20, 20 minute or 15 minute episodes. And then I think we, we didn't know that either. When I saw that it was an hour long special, I was kind of surprised. How did that, um, affect yeah. kind of your recording process or didn't it affect it at all? It didn't affect it at all because at the time we didn't, re we knew just about as much as the people, you know, making the show did. Mm -hmm. I only found out recently that it was going to be a special. I think a couple, I would say a couple weeks ago. Up until that point, we thought it was going to be about, I don't know how much I'm allowed to say, but at that point we thought it was going to be episodic, but then it decided to turn into a special. And I honestly think that was, like I said earlier, I think that I, I really think that was the right call to make because it flows so well together as a special that, you know, you want to have this introductory um, like passage basically to get to know these characters, just kind of like a you know a little taste of what's to come. And I, I think I think people will really be happy uh, about it. That's kind of like an introductory passage and get to know these characters more. <laughs> yeah, definitely. hopefully. Yeah, and speaking of kind of the ensemble of, of yeah. characters that we have here, did you get a chance to record at all with your co-stars, or were they all kind of solo for the first uh, special? 
So we try outside of pickups, we record together every time. Um, this, well, yeah, outside of outside of the uh, outside of Mark Hamill, Rosario Dawson, and Bruce Campbell, who all recorded separately because they they're obviously super busy right. <laughs> <laughs> on their own schedules. Um, it was me, Monte Hernandez, Charlie Demers, and Garland the Wit. Uh, half the cast is in LA, half the cast is in Vancouver. So it's me and Charlie in Vancouver. Uh, Monte and Garland in LA, and we use this technology called SyncSpeak, where it's basically kind of like Skype, but more expensive, I guess, and uh, better sound quality, I, I guess, because it has to, if, if you want to, you know, kind of, if the director wants to give direction at the exact, like, pinpoint direction at the exact point in time. I'm not exactly sure how it works, but uh, yeah. The one of the, the writer of the books, obviously Max, is a co showrunner on the series too. So how was that having him there as kind of like a sounding board or as uh, you know, a point of reference while you guys were recording? He would only ever from my experience, he would only ever stop in occasionally. Sure. I remember he did actually come to Vancouver once. Um he him, uh the showrunner, Scott Peterson, uh, I think, and a few others actually came to Vancouver. Uh, we had lunch together and, uh, you know, just, I assume they, they just, they just, they were all really cool and really nice. I remember, um, my, I remember my girlfriend at the time, uh, had unfortunately gone into an accident and she's from, she's from Long Island and Max is also from Long Island. And it turns out they were actually really close to each other. So Max, um, told me to tell her that, you know, like, is she okay and everything and like, covers and she was really happy about that so yeah that's really sweet i'm, I'm glad she's okay and hope she's okay yeah oh no she's she's fantastic now <laughs> she's doing really well um since you did get a chance to check out this first special do you happen to have a favorite moment from the first episode whether it's your character or something else that happened i think the entire segment of when the zombie apocalypse first happened mm -hmm. the just the animation i think the the animation in that entire segment is just top notch the three D. There's this great, um, uh, there's this great like rotation around uh, Quint and Jack. I remember this scene. And then when the rotation stops, you see this uh, giant like green portal that's extremely well animated. There's that whole scene in the bus as well. Everything flows so well. I, I don't know. There's something about there's something about that scene, and then obviously the ending as well, where I take down Blarg. Right. Uh, spoiler. <laughs> Uh, but uh, but uh, yeah, no that that was that was that was great. And just the point of here, all of our performances actually come to life like that. It kind of utilized is it's a pretty cool thing to see in general. Yeah, that's I mean that's a great way to sum up the special in general. Is just like it's a pretty cool thing to see. <laughs> There's so much going on, and it's such a kind of like a unique take on uh, a somewhat familiar story that we've seen before. But it was really fun without giving too much away. Yeah. Or, or getting in trouble with anything you can't say. What are you most looking forward to in maybe some future episodes? Uh, well, <laughs> again, I don't know what I can and can't say. Sure. But I will say that there are some there are some uh, great moments that have yet to be adapted, and I'm very much hoping that uh, you know people would in fact enjoy them because I know for a fact that I would very much enjoy them as well because I've, uh, I've, you know, I've read some of the books just like as reference sure. and there's some great moments in them uh, that would be like, oh man, it should be so cool to do. Like, uh, and like actually like on the big screen, I was like, I remember reading, there was like a, in the book, I don't want to say anything just in case people, some people haven't read the book, but there's a book later on that it was that like things that was just like going through this like portal and it's like winter time and I'm like, oh my god, that'd be so awesome to adapt. <laughs> but yeah. Cool. Hopefully we get to see that. Uh at the end of the special we do have a you know, we get the title card, the, the last kids, and then it says to be continued. So hopefully we're gonna see more of that soon. Uh but we do get a new character introduced at the very tail end of this special who seems like maybe they're gonna play a threat yeah. to the next uh to you yeah, guys next that's season. Right. Hey, you don't, you don't know if they're going to be a threat. That's true. They could actually be a very good ally. They could flip the tables on you. We don't know. They could be a villain. That's a Although, great Although, yeah. you did say that, it, it, yeah, you did say that the last kids on our title cards weren't the end. 
but it actually came up at the beginning as well. That's true. There was a slow motion kind of Kung Fu Panda style uh, <laughs> explosion scene where the title card came up, and I was uh, running from Blarg, and uh, yeah, that was a, that was a great one too. That's what's great about this special. It's got so many different inspirations from so many different sources, but also kind of has its own, just in general, this own unique flavor to it, like I was saying earlier. So, um, yeah, it just combines those all together on top of its unique spin on everything, and then you got, you got Last Kids on Earth, baby. Exactly. Even, it's great when even the title cards are fun to watch and talk about. Like, that's the mark of a good show, I think, when you can even make the title cards exciting. That's a good time. Before I run out of time with you, yeah, this, will be, totally. this will be my last question for you today. What is up next for you? You've obviously got more of this uh, ahead, hopefully, for fans out there. But what else are you up to these days? You know, it's funny you say that. Um, my friend, me, me and a couple of my friends are uh, working on a pilot together. I can't say for what network uh, because I don't know if I am allowed to say what network. But we are we're, we're working on a pilot. Um, I'm just voicing in it. And my brother's also voicing in it. So I, I play one character who only has a couple lines. And I also, me and my brother actually share a role as like, well, I can't, I can't say anything, but it, it, you're probably like, wait, what do you mean share a role? <laughs> you'll, you'll see. You'll see. It's, but I will say this. It is some of the most fun I have ever had recording a TV show ever. I remember, like, I was, this one I actually recorded out of my house. I don't know how they were okay with that. <laughs> but they were, and it's going on TV. Very but cool. yeah, it, it was, it was, it was, brilliant. yeah. Well, again, thank you so much for your time today. Uh, I think that's about it for me today. So thanks once again, best of luck with the rollout of this show and really looking forward to finding out more about that pilot so I can figure out what role you two guys are playing. Oh no. Yeah, totally. It's like we, we both play one role, but we also share half a role. So one and a half roles for each of us. Gotcha. <laughs> well, that's a good tease. We'll leave yeah. it there for the fans out there and we will uh, keep an eye out for more. Thanks again. Thank you. All right. Excellent. Thank Thanks you Dave. so much, Nick. Yeah. Thank you, Dave. Thank you, Nick. Thank you, Problematic Jack. Oh, boy. <laughs> Have you cooled off? Have you cooled off yet in the last 20 minutes? Oh, man. Well, now, hopefully, we're going to get an opportunity to say what our review is for the actual show. I mean, we're running the show, so if you want the opportunity, by all means, take it away. So, for any new listeners out there, we can recommend something and we can tell you why. We cannot recommend something and we can say exactly why we don't recommend it. Why we should persuade you to save and spend your Netflix time elsewhere. And then finally, if we decide that we're not going to recommend something, we can go one step further and we can say we're going to dip this cartoon, which means that we are going to dip it into the Roger Rabbit style dip from Who Framed Roger Rabbit, which erases it from the annals of cartoon history. And so tonight for The Last Kids on Earth. How are you feeling, Dave? So dramatic. Uh, I'm not I know. dipping it for, for sure. I'm not dipping it. Okay. I'm going to recommend it because I think there's enough here to recommend it. There's a couple issues which we've talked about, mostly focusing on kind of the main character and a little bit of jank animation from time to time. But I like the look of this. It's different. It's unique from most of the other things on Netflix. There's a couple other titles that look vaguely similar, but they don't have that kind of, you know, the background uh, art and source that they came from, from the character designs to the interesting monsters and stuff that they kind of roll in. They don't really bring that. So on that sense, I'd say check it out. Um, and you've also got four more seasons of this coming. <laughs> you know, all four, all four have been greenlit, right? All four, probably. We don't know. Probably. They don't tell us anything. Yeah. But uh, well, one would imagine that those are are still on the way. So I would say get in, check it out now. See if you're into the introductory stuff, and then later, if the rest of them shows up and you're really not into it, then you can feel free to pass. We'll probably revisit this on a future episode too, and we'll we'll track Jack's act, see how he does. I'm actually, I am curious to kind of follow up when yeah. the next special comes out to, to see what the next chapter entails. Uh, I will say I'm going to go down kind of like a, like a dialogue tree in terms of, uh, or maybe a choose your own adventure in sure, terms of my yeah. recommendation for We're tonight. on page 56 if you're following along at home. I'm going to say if you allow your children to watch this without any adult supervision, I do not recommend this cartoon. Wow. I only recommend this if you are willing to sit down with your kid, watch it, enjoy it with them, and then have the conversation, why is Jack such a problematic character? If you're willing to watch, enjoy this with your kid, and ask the questions, some of the ones that Dave had posed earlier, you know, why is Jack, you know, what did you like about Jack? You know, what did you not like about Jack? I think that there's a serious discussion that has to be said. 
uh, especially for a show that is going to spend, you know, this, I want to say, misogynistic damsel in distress kind of fantasy that Jack has for the entire hour and five minutes, but comes to finally a boil 44 minutes in and then never really addressed or kind of pegged down and unpacked. And so I think that there's definitely some problematic stuff that's there. Uh, you know, if you are a parent watching it, the only way I would recommend it is if you actually watch this with your kids and have that conversation. Interesting. So if uh, if a kid were to watch this on their own, would, I don't recommend that kid. Then would you? Would you? I well, did. Are I you dip that, the kid? I dipped the kid. Oh I dipped God. the kid. This is, ladies and gentlemen, we have dipped. <laughs> this their is the first, first child. <laughs> <laughs> They're fine though. It only affects tunes. They'll yeah, just be kind of like oily when you pull them out. They're fine. Yeah. Yeah. It's just like dipping your hand in all. They oil. may have like bits of dead dissolved tunes sticking to them, but it's fine. <laughs> Gross. Yeah. You did it. You dipped the kid. Well, you know. If you're a concerned parent out there, don't let your kid near dip either. Yeah. It's not good. Toxic. Exactly. Toxic stuff. So we're split. It sounds like we're split. Yeah. I think that this is one of those things where I definitely want to see what chapter two brings to see if they actually address some of this to move in a direction. I think that that might allow me to go back and revise what my current uh, assessment is, but... I think that there's some definite problems. There's definite conversation that needs to come out of this cartoon because honestly, this is 2019 and to have something like that at this day and age feels very problematic for me. What's interesting though too is like you, we've watched shows, especially Netflix and, and DreamWorks uh, shows that they've evolved over time. Right. Sometimes they've hit some stumbling blocks in trying to either appease fans or appease producers or whatever, you know, what have you. But we've, we've watched <clears throat> them kind of, yeah. We've watched them kind of evolve. I mean, you can you can watch Voltron kind of climb and then stumble a little bit and then try to climb back up. You can watch right. Shiraj just kind of like meteoric rise to the top. Same so with like good. Steven Universe, things like that. So I'm hoping that even though this is a you know seasonal release, I'm hoping that maybe there's some feedback that uh, Brailler got from the books. Maybe the books improved over the course of time. If they're similar, we don't know. We don't know if they're you know if problematic. Jack <laughs> continues in the books as well, but maybe he got progressively. You know, more aware, more woke, as the God, I, as I the hope, youth I, say. I really hope it's just more self awareness for him. I think that that's really what this show needs, which is important. Yeah, extremely important. Uh, so those are our final says right. on the last kids on Earth. Sean, Sean dipped a kid. I say just watch a cartoon. <laughs> <laughs> wild episode. <laughs> Absolutely wild. Uh, so you'll be able to you'll be able to check out this cartoon in three days. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, man. All right. Sorry, well, Netflix hey. is at the door. They want to have a word. I'll be right back. Well, hey, look, Netflix Netflix don't pay me, so they ain't pay, pay me, so I can say whatever I want. That's right. Also, Netflix, if you're listening, and I know you are, feel free to reach out to me. Feel free you to can, pay us. You can pay me, but I'm also still going to give honest reviews about <laughs> stuff, so it doesn't matter. Also, if you guys are interested in a Netflix ain't pay me shirt, that's our new merchandise that we have coming out as a new line. Yep. Keep those eyes open. <laughs> yep. Also, speaking of fun t-shirts and people who are fun and awkward segues, you heard him on this episode, our friend Bobby Anthem. You can hear him on his paranormal podcast, Inhuman Experience, with his co-host Bobby Blades, and you can find him on Twitter at IEXP underscore podcast, and Bobby has a solo show called In Search of My Lost Soul, which is available now, along with the Inhuman Experience podcast, available on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, anywhere that you guys listen to podcasts. Check out In Search of My Lost Soul. It is simply wonderful. It's very Start good. From it, a, it, yeah. it makes us feel bad about how stupid we are on this podcast <laughs> and how not serious we are about anything, really. Uh, but honestly, we talked about self-awareness and reflection. Go back and listen to In Search of My Lost Soul. That's that true. has everything that you would need from somebody to say, hey, the oh, being like a human is complicated. Bobby needs to take problematic Jack aside and be like, here's, in Bobby voice, here's all the things you're doing wrong. And how to fix them. <laughs> oh, my God. I would love that. That would be great. Dave, what do you have going on, buddy? Uh, same old stuff. You can find me over at Collider.com. You can find me at Netflix's Pocketbook. You can also find me on Twitter <laughs> at Dr. Claw MD. And as always, you can pick up my book, The Science of Breaking Bad, from MIT Press, available on Amazon and wherever awesome books are sold. What about you, bud? Awesome. I perform live improv comedy with a group that's called Knox. That's N-O-X exclamation point. We perform with Washington Improv Theater. You can find tickets and times with dc.org. And I'm always on Twitter and Instagram at Sean Paul He's Ellis. Always on them. Always on them. I really should not be on them as much. <laughs> That's my, true. You and me both. Yeah, my screen time app tells me that I gotta I gotta cut back. Your parents gotta be watching you. Yeah, honestly. 
But in the meantime, want to support us? Yeah, it's really super easy. You can visit our Patreon. For the price of a cup of coffee, you can support this podcast, which is, again, not receiving Netflix money. No, and look, man, even diner coffee. We're talking like old school, middle of Nebraska, roadside diner coffee. One buck. One buck will get you. Mm. Also, just tell a friend. Review us on Apple iTunes. Everything helps. You can slide into our DMs on Twitter at Morning Tunes. Remember, that's morning with a U. Check us out on Instagram and Facebook, Saturday Morning Cartoons, and drop us an old-fashioned email, SaturdayMorningCartoons at gmail.com. You can find all of these links in our link tree that is in the bio for all of our social media sites, and we are always available for free on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, Spotify, wherever fine podcasts are sold. Ah, oh, that is it for the last kids on Earth. Done. Apocalypse dipped. over. <laughs> Kid dips. Uh, we are going to be back next week. So please make sure that you tune in and we'll talk to you then. Dip the kid. We'll see you next time. Dip the kid. (laughs) Hey, everybody. Thanks a lot for listening to Saturday Morning Cartoons. Now, if you'll excuse me, I have to transform and roll out.